your cybersecurity solution is here. Introducing Pentester's Advanced Cybersecurity Suite. Ready for peace of mind? Try it for free. No credit card required. Pentester.com. Reform Gangsters. Um, if you like my content, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell. Also, don't forget about my Patreon. I have a lot of exclusive content on there. Um, I've been making new content like crazy. Um, it's all on Patreon. The membership start at a dollar. Check it out. Also, don't forget about my store. I have some nice items, hats, shirts, mugs, Fat Andy t-shirts. Um, so, you know, check it out. So today, you know, a lot of people have been asking me about my recovery and the mob. I just, I just did it also. I just did an interview with a, a, a college student in, in California that's doing a paper on me, believe it or not. And he said that a lot of people on his college campus watch my podcast because they're very interested in how I used to be a mob guy, a violent criminal. And how I, in my recovery, and how I live today, how I made these changes, you know, and especially about my recovery that I'm open with it. So today, I saw a picture on um, social media the other day of uh, John Gotti and Tony Lee. And I put it up on my, I put it up on my social media today. That's the picture right there. You can see that picture right there. That's the picture right there of Tony Lee walking with John with his arm. And that's how Tony used to walk with me. He used to put his arm inside my arm and we used to walk and do walker talks. Those are two men that I know. Well, Tony Lee, I knew my whole life. He baptized my brother. He was my godfather of confirmation. He was my father, Fat Andy's partner from when they were teenagers. John Gotti, I met when I was 12 or 13. So I knew him for a major part of my life. And, uh, you know, um, and as far as my addiction goes, you know, I started out, you know, using drugs in the 60s, you know, recreationally. In the 70s, everybody was blowing cocaine. It was the disco era. I mean, everybody in the mob was drinking and blowing cocaine. A lot of addiction and alcoholism in the mob. A lot of it's undercover, on the down low. You know, mine wasn't. Um, but these two men who are two mob guys, two gangsters, two uh, La Costa Nostra all the way, I mean, you know, they both played a major role in my recovery. Um, it's amazing, you know, one, well, Tony Lee played a major role throughout, but he stepped up for me in, in the beginning and John stepped up for me right after I got out of treatment. And I want to explain to you how this all transpired. I hit a bottom in 88 and, uh, and, and, and I, and I, and I, uh, I want to go in treatment and I had no money. I had no insurance back then. Um, I lived on 88th Street upstairs from my mother. I had a wife, Alice, and I had a five-year-old son, Anthony. And um, I hit a bottom. I woke up one day and I was caught and I was done. I was, you know, in a lot of pain, physical pain. And my father was in prison doing 40 years. And I just, I, and I wanted my, my self-respect back. I wanted to, I wanted to get back into the mob. I wanted to be a mob guy again. Actually, really, as sick as that sounds, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get healthy again. So I could start making money and I could get, you know, back in with everybody, you know, because I was, you know, not going around. I was looking bad. Um, not that I didn't get chased for all these morons out there that say I got chased. I did, never got chased. Nobody ever chased me. I never was chased. Never, ever got chased. I hit a bottom. I don't know what to do. My father's doing 40 years. I called up Cafe Liberty. I called up Tony Lee who's a gangster, a wise guy. I asked him to come to my house. He comes to my house. We're sitting down in my kitchen. Tony Lee, Alice, my wife, and myself. And I tell Tony Lee, you know, listen, I got a problem here. Um, I need to stop. And he says, yeah, you do. I know you do. I says, uh, but, you know, I have a bed in a treatment center in Vermont called Founders Hall. It's a private treatment center, but I don't have the money. 
He says to me, how much is it? I said, it's $250 a day. I have, they want me to sign. They want me to stay there for at least 21 days. Now that was a lot of money. This is, this is February of 1988. Today, treatment centers are thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a day. I should know I work at treatment centers, but back then, this was $250 a day. You're talking a lot of money. And they wanted me to make a 21-day commitment. I said, it's $250 a day. Uh, and I, I, I need to get out of New York for a while. I need, I need to, you know, I need to get myself together. And he says to me, he used to call my, me Sonny. That was like my nickname with him. And he got up and he stood up and he looked at me and he goes, you know what, Sonny? He said, I'm going to pay for this. But as far as I'm concerned, you may be too far gone. He told me, I says, well, I, you know, it, I, I need to try. And uh, he paid, you know, he paid for it. He paid for it, $250 a day. Um, he, he, he sent, he sent the, um, he's paid for it. He gave me the cash. I flew up to, I, uh, he got me a plane ticket. I flew to Vermont. Um, I paid for, for the treatment center. I stood there 21 days. You know, he stuck by me. I got out um, on a Wednesday. And I went to see him and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, he accepted me right back. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, I was with him all day Thursday. You know, he told me that from now on, I was going to drive him around. He wanted me with him every day. And I agreed. Um, and that Saturday, him and I, he took, I met him at Cafe Liberty and we went to the Bergen Hunt Fish Club. And now I'm only home out of treatment for two days because John Gotti used to hold court on Saturdays at the Burger Fish Club and he used to eat lunch there. And that was one of the reasons why I, I wanted to stop was because I wanted to get back in with everybody. I wanted to get straightened out. I wanted to make money again. You know, I wanted back in. And um, because I chose to be out, not that I got chased. I chose to be out. Uh, I chose not to go around because I had other habits. So anyway, Saturday, him and I, Tony he takes me, he goes, we go to the Burger Hunt Fish Club. Um, we walk in, John's happy to see me, hugs me, kisses me. Everybody's there treating me great. Jeannie, I don't know if Jeannie was there. Um, Jeannie might have been in jail or No, Jeannie wasn't in jail yet. I'm, I'm sorry. No, Jeannie was, I don't remember Jeannie was there, but I know Angelo Quack was there. Um, a lot of guys were there. I mean, a lot of some, and there was even a couple of guys that didn't even know me. And they were like just staring at me because, you know, when, when I walked in, when I walked in, people were happy to see me. They made like a little bit of a fuss that I was there, you know. And guy and John said, oh, this is Fat Andy's son when he's staring at, you know. And oh, my God, how's your father? So anyway, I said this story many times. Um, John Gotti tells me, come outside. He wants to talk to me. We walk outside and we walk around the block. Um, and he asks me, he looked at me and he goes, so you think you have a beat? And I said, I think today I do. Yeah, you know, I'm going to give it my best shot and everything. And he says, okay, good. Um, then he asked me if I needed anything, if I want. And I said, well, I, I don't, I said, I, I said, I really don't, I, I don't have a car. And, uh, and he said, you don't have a car. And I said, they told the story many times after that. And he goes, um, all right, we go back around the corner. He goes in his office, he comes out. He tells me, listen, go to 84th street. And go in there, ask for this guy, Anthony, and take a car. I said, really? He goes, yeah. Tony Lee, he says, tell Tony to drive you over there. I get Tony Lee's car. I go to the car lot. I walk in. I ask the guy, you Anthony? He goes, yeah. I said, I'm Anthony. John sent me. He said, take whatever car you want. I found a white four-door Bonneville, which was a nice-looking car back then. I took that car. I drove back to the Bird Gun Fish Club. I saw John. And... Uh, I showed him the car and he went in his pocket and he said, and he handed me money. And I said, what's this? He goes, that's $2,000. He said, I don't want, I don't want you to get stressed out. He said, here's $2,000. I want you to come here every week with a hundred dollars. And he said, and don't fucking disappoint me. And I said, you got it. I went back one week. I gave him a hundred. I went back another week. I gave him a hundred. Third week. I went back. He asked me how much I owed him. And I said, I owe you 1700. He goes, all right. How you doing? I said, I'm doing good now. I'm looking good. I'm clean. I got nice clothes on. I'm, you know, looking, starting to get healthy. I'm back in the number office. So he knows I'm back in the street doing what I got to do. I'm driving Tony Lee around. And he told me, keep the money as a gift. So now here's these two gangsters, two, you know, wise guys 
looking out for me. You know, um, it, it's, uh, you know, like, those are the human sides of them, I guess, you know, but here's two guys that will kill you in the blink of an eye, but yet, you know, they're looking out for me. You know, I guess they were looking out for me because number one, I was fat Andy's son out of respect for my father. And number two is they can't, I know Tony Lee loved me like a son. And John liked me, he always liked me, he always treated me well. I think it was because I was a convict. I went to jail when I was a kid. And for some reason he liked that, you know, and we used to have some good conversations, him and I about stuff. And, uh, and he always looked out for me. You know, I know there's haters out there that, that try to say derogatory stuff about my relationship with these two people, but that's how it really was, you know, and the people that know me know that's how it really was. So these two guys played a really, really big part in my recovery. And, um, you know, I don't know if it was good or bad because, you know, now I'm back involved. I'm hanging out. John's the boss. I'm going to all these clubs with him. Club A, the Brown Derby in Brooklyn. <clears throat> you know, I'm driving Tony up to meet him with Joe Watts for lunches, you know. And, you know, and now I'm red hot. You know, I'm going to, you know, then he gets arrested. I get arrested again in 91 and go to jail, you know. The headline is, you know, John Gotti, John Gotti. I'm hooked up with John Gotti between me and Fat Andy's son and being hooked up with John Gotti. I had no shot. I had no shot to stay out of jail. So I don't know if it was a blessing or not, but they played a major role in my in my in my recovery on both ends. So I'm 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 glad for that. That was great. Hang on. Um so some fans asking, you seen the uh, Justin Timberlake article in the paper, his DUI. With someone with that much money, a history of substance abuse, he's got to know he's he's messed up. Why not just have someone drive him around? Is that a, a sign of addiction when you're making those that kind of bad choice? Yeah, it's stinky thinking. I mean, yeah, you know, when you're wrapped up in the disease of addiction, you know, you don't make good decisions. I mean, you know, listen, but it doesn't matter. Michael Jackson had a doctor shooting him up every night. He's still overdosed and dying. I mean, you know, addiction is addiction. Should he have had a driver? Should he have taken Ubers or had a had a limo driver? Most definitely. Without a doubt, he should have had it. But I guess he probably started out sober driving and then and then get got drunk and didn't care. You know, once you're drunk, once you once your mind is altered, you know, he was drinking people's drinks off their tables. And in, in, in wherever he was, he was walking up to Shares Justin Timberlake, a world renowned star, walking up to strangers' tables and drinking their drinks. I mean, that's how drunk the guy was. You know, that's the stinky thinking. That's the disease of addiction. We make bad decisions. Cheryl Costa. Well, actually, hi, Anthony. My name is Tommy Costa, and I'm from Howard Beach, left around 89, 90. Whatever happened to Richie Buffalino? had the little car service locally. I worked. And then after he opened up a small candy store with his wife, do you remember Richie? I hear he is still around. You may even remember me. Hell, I used to drive everybody around back then. I lived in Lindenwood, 149th Avenue, next to the vacant lot by Conduit. I mean, listen, all the Buffalinos are still around. I mean, there's, there's a lot of Buffalinos. They all come from out of East New York. I'm, you know, um, I don't know if he's around or not. I haven't been in that neighborhood in 20 years. But I knew the Buffalinos. I probably knew his uncles more better than him. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't know if he's still around. I don't know what he's up to, but I do remember all the a lot of Buffalinos. A couple of them are made members now. A couple of the younger guys got straightened out with the Gambino family. Rayo is asking, have you ever heard of Joe Dada? Yes, I have heard of Joe Dada. I knew Joe Dada. He was good friends with my father. Very nice guy, comical. Yeah, I know. I definitely know him. Would you do a segment on him? <laughs> Joe Dada? Joe Dada? Could I do a segment? I guess I could. Yeah, I could do a segment on him. He was a well-known guy. He was a little bit of a swindler, but he was a well-known guy. Joseph asked, did John Gotti really have a relationship with O'Neill's daughter? It's not O'Neill's daughter. It's his stepdaughter. And yes, he did. The question is, do you have any pictures from your weddings? And what was it like at 3 a.m. at your wedding? What's, what was going on? So I have pictures of my wedding. I have pictures of my wedding, but only of the bridal party and everything. I really don't have any pictures, not many pictures of the guests that were there. There was a thousand people at my wedding. 
It was the whole three floors. And how was it at three o'clock in the morning? Um, as time, as night, as the time went on, a lot of guys brought their wives and girlfriends home and came back. And I would say about four in the morning, there was probably 200 guys there drinking with my father. Um, everybody got a bag of bagels and a Sunday news on their way out the door. Um, that was a thing back then at the La Mia. On Saturday night weddings, they gave out a bag of bagels, really good bagels, and a Sunday Daily News, which was big back then. It was, remember, it was big, thick with the comics. And people remember back in the day, the New York Sunday Daily News was like, you know, had, had everything in it. Um, no internet, so, you know, it had everything in it. And, yeah, at the end, of, as it got to, my father stood there actually till the next afternoon drinking. I left. I left about 6 in the morning. And we went to the um, the Hilton Hotel. We went. I had a suite at the Hilton Hotel, and I went to the Hilton Hotel with my wife and uh, a couple of friends of mine and their girls and their wives. And we stood at the Hilton, but my father actually stood at the La Mia with a lot of guys, a lot of fucking mob guys. They were just drinking and partying. It was crazy, crazy night. Somebody said, "I bet the FBI was at your wedding." I'm sure, they were. The first person to arrive was Rusty Buffalino from Pittston, the guy that Joe Pesky played in The Irishman. He was literally the first guest. I had a thousand people that I had a thousand guests at my wedding. And how do I know I had a thousand guests? Because we just gave out envelopes. We went to every club and the whole, all the five families. We just went to their like headquarters with, with envelopes, invitations. And then we sent them out of town. And out of a thousand guests, he was the first guest with his crew to walk in the door. <laughs> he drove from Pittston all the way down to Brooklyn to come to my wedding. Eric Christensen says, wow, Rouge, when I watched Forrest Gump for the first time, I thought, wow, how could, some, how could you imagine a person seeing as much in a lifetime as he did? Well, I think all the things you've seen and done is as close as Forrest. <laughs> all right and i'll the take biggest, that as a compliment <laughs> and the biggest comparison and most important is you are so down to earth and not have a swollen head you're awesome dude thank you okay don't forget next week the form gangsters will be in new york doing a mob tour if you're interested in coming on the tour purchase some tickets please contact me at anthony ruggiano jr at gmail.com and there's tickets on sale. Everybody's going to be vetted. We don't want no nonsense. So if you're serious, come on board. You're welcome. More than welcome. And thank you for watching. Reform Gangsters. And don't forget, if you like the content, subscribe, ring the bell. And please check out my Patreon. There's a lot of exclusive content now. I've been making a lot of good content. I was in Tampa last week. I did some really good stuff. Um, I have a lot of good stuff coming up, so uh, check it out. It's only a dollar to start. Join my show. Please join my Patreon. Ask your questions live. And please uh, join my Patreon at reformgangsters.com.